afternoon and evening. Thank you so much for joining today's session with an esteemed speaker guest, Dr. Omar Sadat is a consultant vascular surgeon at East and North uh, Hertfordshire NHS Trust. He's an affiliate member of Cambridge Mathematics of Information in Healthcare Hub and Department of Proteomics at University of Cambridge. He's a distinguished professor and adjunct director of Nanjing Institute of Neurosciences, Nanjing, China. Dr. Sadas research interest lies at the interface of medical imaging. He has extensive work done in medical imaging uh, for 15 years and has resulted in foundational development of imaging techniques, such as with MRI and clinical research. Uh, the ongoing work aims to analyze existing endovascular technologies such as aortic stents in terms of their effective durability with the view to develop the next generation of durable endovascular bioprostheses. Dr. Sadat also has extensive research experience in clinical trials aimed at assessing the role of unknown uh, and novel pharmaceutical agents against contrast-induced acute kidney injury. Uh, Dr. Sadat, also a keen educationist and has mentored research students, PhDs at the University of Cambridge. He's a contributor and ad advisor for the development of research curricula in the UK for middle to lower income countries. He has been previously the BMG fellow and co-investigator for the Solo Cohen Prize Award awarded by the Vascular Society of Great Britain and Ireland. Dr. Sadat's extensive contribution to scientific and clinical research was acknowledged with the award of Ontarian Professorship in 2019 from the Royal College of Surgeons of England, which is one of the highest honors that can be conferred to a scientist surgeon. Just to share with you, the Ontarian Professor Award dates back to to 1810 and recognizes exceptional surgeons who have produced world-leading original research. This award is given in the memory of Dr. John Hunter, who is considered as the father of scientific surgery. In past 200 years, since the Hunterian professorship has been awarded, Dr. Sadat is the first Pakistani who received this award for his research work in multiple diverse disciplines, including vascular surgery, bioengineering, magnetic resonance, imaging physics, and vascular medicine. Dr. Sadas also, also answered the questions by the students, especially about research and education in Cambridge. Uh, he, he told about the Nobel laureates and their research. He praised King Edward Medical College University for recent research development. Over to you, Dr. Sadat. Let oh, thank you very much uh, for giving me this uh, great opportunity to come and uh, talk with the uh, such a diverse audience uh, of honorable uh, physicians, surgeons, and academics here. Uh, you have given such, a, uh, such an amazing introduction of me. I hope that I can live up to that introduction now. Uh, I've been given a quite a difficult topic to talk, talk about, and that was uh, the future of research and what is the vision of that future research and how I see it. So I'm a vascular surgeon by training, uh, but the number of years that I've spent in academia, in research, which is quite diverse and has been, uh, you have been told about what uh, facets of research you know, I'm involved in. Um, I'll try to share most of my personal experiences with you and what I think uh, can be the future vision of research. And I've tried to keep it quite realistic rather than present you with a utopian vision, which is uh, something that we don't want to hear because it's not gonna be achievable. Uh, I can uh, tell you that I don't have any financial conflict of interest here to declare. So with this out of the way, uh, I think it's very important that before we talk about the uh, future of research, we have to acknowledge of all the great work which has been done by the uh, previous great scientists, researchers, academics, clinicians, uh, and, and anyone who has tried to uh, look for answers to very difficult questions. And only by acknowledging those great people can we uh, look forward. So let's try to see where did this all begin from. And this is really, really important because um, we have to track uh, our journey 
from its from its beginnings, at least from this century or at least from the century before. Uh, it's very easy to forget that the public funding of research is actually a 20th century phenomenon. Uh, it emerged from the warfare uh, where engineering and technology became paramount. And UK Research Council, which are basically the forebears of uh, UK Research Initiative, it emerged from World War I and their shape uh, was determined by a report on the machinery of government by Lord Haldane, uh, who actually belonged to the Ministry of Reconstruction at the time. And in World War II, the science became even more important and relevant. So much so that uh, President Roosevelt at that time wrote a letter to uh, what was uh, going to be the first scientific advisor to any US president, which was Dr. Venevar Bush. And he actually asked him to provide him with some recommendations, which are very nicely uh, enlisted here in this letter from a president to his scientific advisor. And you can see here that first he asks him that what can be done consistent with the military security and with the prior approval of the military authorities to make known to the world as soon as possible the contributions which have been made during our war effort to the scientific knowledge. So basically trying to make the world aware of all the contributions that the scientists have actually brought in, which was responsible to the uh, victory of the allied forces. And this was quite important because this would actually stimulate the new enterprises and help create jobs uh, from the returning servicemen and from other people in the communities. And this is all very relevant because as we go along in our journey today, you will see how important it is for the president or for the commander in chief of a, of a country to take such initiative. Otherwise in our own individual, uh, you know, uh, uh, selves, we are quite, diff it, is, it is very difficult for us to uh, create such a revolution on such a large scale. Secondly, he asked about if we can prioritize uh, our war against different diseases, and then what could be done to organize a program of continued research in the future. Thirdly, he talked about that, what can the government do now and in the future to aid research activities by public and private organizations? And fourth, can an effective program be proposed for discovering and developing scientific talent in American youth? So you can see these are three or four really salient points which he wanted this uh, electrical engineer to give him recommendations about and shows how much interest a president was taking at the time because he knew that the victory of the allied forces was basically the work of the scientists uh, and all the engineers to help them create all the, the scientific advancement of the time. And Dr. Bush at that time then created a seminal report which was released to, released to the public on July 19th, 1945. And this report is easily accessible on internet right now. It's also present in a book form as well. The title was Science, the Endless Frontier and it made the case for why US should continue its investment in fundamental science and engineering research Dr. Bush also argued for the creation of a new organization devoted to funding fundamental research. And that laid the foundation of National Science Foundation, which is the most prestigious foundation in the US and perhaps in the world. And this was the time of Henry Truman in 1950. Now it's really important also to realize that Dr. Bush also held a very prestigious position in the community, in the scientific community. <clears throat> you can see here that according to Collier's magazine, Almost fourth of all the physicists in US and a third of the top most chemists used to work on projects which were being proposed by Dr. Bush. So he had the, the position and that aura around him that people would listen to him. And he also had the backing of the president. And this is a very powerful position to be in. So the whole focus of this uh, report was basically to emphasize on making fundamental discoveries. And then from these fundamental discoveries, would the scientists and engineers be able to make translational changes in healthcare and in different aspects of society? Both reports, one from Haldane and the other from Dr. Bush identified and emphasized the importance of basic research. And from there, moving right to the recent events, there has been no 
stop gap whatsoever. And we have seen how much of a fascinating and mind boggling um, far space research has been done in the West. And recently we saw the evidence of that amazing work when within a few weeks after we knew that there was a new virus, the SARS-2 virus, we were able to sequence it. And it was basically based on the work of people who were interested in heredity, diversity, and science of life. And this was a very different sort of emergency to warfare, but you can see that what was started on warfare footing was basically of so much use, not only to create a renaissance for the entire last century, but also to deal with this recent pandemic. But it is also really, really important and helpful to understand that this war is still ongoing because there are pandemics happening all the time around us. The pandemics of diabetes, the pandemic of hypertension, the pandemic of ischemic heart disease, and you name it. And almost all of these pandemics are actually driven by human demography. The population of the planet is about 7.5 billion, and there is a large population which is aging in different parts of the world. And then we have the young population which has its own health issues. Then there are the effects of humans and other species on the planet, the climate change and the environmental degradation. We are also going through a huge technological revolution in which information technology, including the use of artificial intelligence is also a very important part. And all these changes are actually associated with increasing social unrest. They're associated with a rise in populism, a rise in perception of inequalities because there's more awareness. And these inequalities are becoming more apparent and widely recognized in many cases. And these changes are also along with skepticism about what researchers and many innovators fundamental values are, the values of science, the methodologies that scientists use and the values of Western enlightenment. These are, these are all being questioned now. And the truth has been confounded by fake truth or what we call fake news. And this is an area in which artificial intelligence can be deployed on both sides. So it's very fair to say that science, engineering, social sciences, arts and humanities have been responsible for our success as a species. And now we need all these to prevent ourselves from driving us over the cliff. The next 10 to 20 years are a critical time for researchers. Here it is also very important to acknowledge that research and the research enterprise, we all are basically microcosm of the society. And we also have similar social and in some cases antisocial traits. So there are these inherent biases within us. Pretty much all the researchers nowadays acknowledge that research is a team activity. It is multidisciplinary. You cannot do it on your own anymore, except with a few exceptions. But employment and promotion still favor the individual rather than a group. We still have this publish or perish paradigm, which is still there. Funding is still enormously competitive, even in the developed world. All of this creates incentives for bad behavior, such as sloppy research. Therefore, it's very important for us to understand that whatever ideas we want to pursue for our research, they are meaningful and they can be translated into meaningful changes rather than doing endless citations and endless papers which are not going to be translated into a meaningful research idea or a strategy or a policy. And it's very important to understand that the public purse or the government or treasury, whatever you want to call it, is simply not interested in buying a paper which is written by us or a citation. What the taxpayer actually needs is health, well-being, resilience and security. And for all of this, we need a good economy. All of this can be supported by research and innovation. And it is the impact of research that matters the most for holders of public purse. Researchers and contributors are not so important in the bigger scheme of things, which is quite unfortunate. And this is the moment to recognize without personal biases, the gender, race, religious discrimination matters. Therefore, we must reflect on this equality, diversity and inclusion issues in our practices. And not only reflect on those, but also take key steps so that we can overcome this plague which is basically infecting our societies, including academia. One thing that will not change is that research is all about asking questions. 
answers to those questions and can be turned into assets by technologists and engineers into assets. And that can change the world and the human life for better or for worse. And with those species that we share the planet with. And the art of great research is the art of asking the great question. The common characteristics of great research environments is mentorship throughout their careers in framing the current, the correct research questions. And this is a very important slide here. Here you see the graph of research productivity of countries which are developed, countries which are emerging very rapidly and countries which are not doing so good. So in the far left side, you will see a graph in which it shows the journal papers which are being published per a million people. And you'll see countries like USA, which have been doing a great job for the last century or so, have actually been on a steady incline. But then there are countries like Singapore, Norway, and Australia, which basically try to design scientific research-driven economies. And this is actually shown with all the input which has gone in with all the budget and all the support from the government to propel the productivity of research in these countries. And then we have the Middle Eastern and North African countries where there has been a slight uptake gradually. But this is quite an important slide which is in the middle. And you see it's a fraction of publications with domestic corresponding authors. And you will see that although there is, has been an uptick gradually in the middle, in, in the Middle East and the North African countries. But over time, you see a decline in the number of publications in which the corresponding authors belong to these countries. So a lack of continuity is present in these countries. And you can see something very similar in USA, although not of that significance. But in China, you see this is almost plateaued and reached a steady state. Now, this, the, far, the slide on the far right shows the rate of change of publications. And this gray line actually de, um, separates these countries which are developing versus the countries which have done quite well and have almost reached a developed status. And you see there is a lot of staggered trends which are present. So if you see the orange bars here, they show there's a decreasing uh, publication for quite a few years in these countries. Similarly, you see there is a bit of increase, which is shown by these black spots, but unchanged spots, but then there is an increase in quite a few years. So all these Middle Eastern to North African countries, you see there isn't a, a continuous trend with the exception of UAE perhaps, and Algeria, and then Tunisia. The rest of them, there is more like the, the work quite aggressively for some time, there's productivity, then there is a pause and there's a decrease. So there is no continuity there. On the other hand, you see countries like China, USA, either they are unchanged or they are increasing. So it kind of shows you the trend in the countries which are developing and what sort of teething problems they're going through. This is quite an important slide to appreciate here for people from Pakistan that in 2018, there was a paper published in Nature and it found that there was a significant rise in the research output from two countries, so much so that it basically outpaced China. You see Egypt and Pakistan leading at the top and the editors of Nature were a bit puzzled that how can this happen? What would be the cause of such a increase in publication? And they thought it could be that they were a few more journals which have been included into the database which they were using to count the publications from any country. And we do know that people from developing countries do prefer to publish in their own journals. And if those journals get uh, used up in one of these database researches, then you will, searches, you will see that they will be count, counted for actually as a number of public, as a number of publications would increase accordingly. Similarly, there was also speculation that there's an increase of funding and in, in international collaborations that might have boosted these uh, publications from countries like Egypt and Pakistan. When we look at the relationship between the number of publications and the relative impact, it shows quite an interesting trend here that most countries which are increasing the publication count, the impact is decreasing actually. 
And that is shown with this negative correlations in, in this column here. And the only positive correlation that you find here is China in which not only there's an increase in the number of publications, which is shown by this uh, black line, but also the impact or the citation score is also increasing for the, from the, for the Chinese uh, investigators or researchers. And in USA, you see that is not the case. You see that the number of publications is, has been on a steady decline, but the impact has been on an increase. And this leads us to quite an important slide here, which helps us try to understand that what would be the overarching factors which are limiting the developing countries from having a sustained level of productivity, which has got significant impact at least. And that is the lack of sustained support for higher education and research. And this is because there's only a very small fraction of the GDP which is being spent on science and innovation. We do know that there is a lot of incentivization going on in different countries in which publications are used to promote people, but that is not taking into account the quality of publication most of the time. In fact, quantity over quality is used. And this is leading us to the same paradigm again that do we publish or perish? And this is not a very healthy position or a healthy policy to follow. Then we also have this slightly archaic academic culture in which the seniors do not allow the junior colleagues to progress when they're doing higher degrees so that their positions are not threatened. And this is really unhealthy in a few countries. I think people should take lesson from game theory and also the Chinese model in which they basically laid out a thousand talents plan in which people from China, of Chinese origin who had gone abroad and had come back, they were basically given the incentive to set up their research groups with backing of the government. And this is what is responsible over the last two to three decades for that increase in the impact, high quality publications and also the number of publications from China. It is also important to understand that when you start your research, you have to be very humble and also understand that you do not know everything. And this is a problem that I normally see in people from developing countries that we see or we take this as something as a as, as something that we cannot take personally, that if we do not know the answer, that is a weakness. I think if you do not know the answer, that should be a reason for you to do research. Then we have this presence of quite antisocial traits in certain developing countries. And one of that traits is basically the absence of meaningful support by the local faculty and administration for expats who are willing or trying to relocate to their home country. And this actually worsens the brain drain at graduate, postgraduate and faculty levels. And the reasons could be multifactorial. It could be the lack of long-term vision for the country versus oneself. It could be certain inherent complexes, certain insecurities for job and for promotions. We do know that there is nepotism and political promotion which goes around in certain developing countries as well. I mean, these things of course are also existent in developed countries, but the proportion of that is far less. So I think as developing countries, we have to think that whether we are quite happy and keen and content to reinvent the wheel over centuries, or fast track our success. And the choice is basically ours. I think it's very important to remember that a rising tide lifts all the boats. And this is what has exactly happened in China, Singapore, India, Malaysia, and so many other countries. And I think this is a very key slide that people who are in position of authority, professors, professor who, professors who are directors, I think you are basically in a very unique position to implement that change. Because I think we can forgive a child who is afraid of the darkness, but I think it's very difficult and real tragedy of life when men see the light, but they're afraid of it and they don't follow the right thing. There are also certain other limiting factors such as politicized higher education academies and institute where there are monopolies and people who are in a certain monopoly are favored. There's also lack of meaningful and productive interaction with international institutes and faculty beyond signing mem memorandums of understanding. 
and for certain photo sessions, which are seen on different university websites all the time. Then we have unfortunate regional conflicts and socio-political instability and economic instability. And these factors are really important in driving the research policy of any country. And we did see from the very first few slides that how important it was that for the president of USA to back a scientific foundation. And that has led to US becoming the superpower, which has basically almost ruled the uh, scientific uh, renaissance along with a few other countries over the last century or so. We also have to address different research barriers. One of the most important research barriers that I see is the lack of idea generation and creativity. And this is because we're just looking for shortcuts. We just want to have a quick publication so that there can be a quick line on our CV and that can lead to a promotion. But I think we have to really refine our hypotheses. And I think the Socratic method is really important in refining a research question. And that's where the mentorship is really important in helping the student or the mentee to refine that question. Then we have to focus on data integrity. And here mentorship is also equally important because they will inculcate the values of science and research. There's also very important, very important for people to be aware of the medical statistics and different research methodologies. And we have already seen from the previous slides and my initial talk about how important support from the government and the funding is because you cannot conduct meaningful research without funding. I think industry sponsorship is also really important. And I think in our developing countries, this is something which can be tapped a bit more aggressively than just allowing professors to be sponsored to go abroad. I think postgraduate students, PhD students, they should also have industry sponsored studentships. And I think professors can be that liaison between the student and the industry. The medical students and postgraduates should be exposed to research. We also have inadequate facilities. We do not have advanced imaging facilities or lab facilities. And I think that's where it's very important to collaborate internationally or regionally. Similarly, we do know there's limited technical support and inadequate training, but I think collaboration can play a significant role here as well. So what I'm doing here is that I'm presenting you the key questions, which I think are the research barriers and also giving you certain ideas as we go along and this can all shape the future of research. Now, many researchers from the developing countries they do not speak English as their first language. And what that leads to is, it leads to drafting of not so good quality manuscripts. So I think it's very, very important for students, for faculty members, for academics or anyone who aspires to be an academic to write as much as they possibly can. Because only by writing will you be able to improve your English and the way you draft a good quality app, a manuscript. And there is a research ladder as far as uh, medicine is concerned. You can start with simple case reports, case series, going on to cohort studies and quality improvement projects, going on to randomized control tri trials. And then at the top of the pyramid, you have the investigative studies for which you require quite a significant amount of infrastructure and funding. I think there's one thing which holds people back from publishing and that is the fear of rejection. And that fear will only go away if you have a good mentor who, will, who can give you confidence and by you trying to publish. There's also this uncertainty about which journal you should be publishing in. And this will all come with practice and you have to submit to different journals to gauge that in your specialty, your research can be taken up by a certain journal. There's also a lack of culture of publication in a few places, but this is getting better by the day. Then there are competing clinical commitments. And I think this is quite an important aspect in both developing and developed countries. I think people who want to be high quality or high caliber academics, they will have to make a decision that they cannot do private practice or it will, it, it will be at a minimum level. And this is a culture which will develop over time. I think all these habits that I have talked about, if you keep repeating that, you will achieve excellence or you will achieve mediocrity. And this is up to you what you want to achieve. If you think that by doing the wrong thing again and again, 
you will become a successful nation or a successful institute or a successful group leader, then you're basically just lying to yourself. So you have to be very honest when you make these decisions in key positions. I think this is quite an important thing when it comes down to publishing your research. I think you should try to aim high. And by doing that, what you're doing is that you may not be able to get into an international journal, but you will at least get some good reviews from international reviewers. I think there's also very much importance of access to medical journals in, uh, in, in different developing countries because the lack of access to medical journals is a huge problem. And only by accessing those journals will the audience, the public and the academics will be able to understand that what has happened because you need to have the breadth of knowledge and also the depth of knowledge. And that would only come about if you have access to these medical journals. Role of international and local collaborations I've already touched upon. And we have got an example of Chile, which actually produce high levels of scientific productivity despite of having very low level of R&D expend expenditure. And that was basically taking advantage of international collaborations. But I mentioned to you before that these collaborations have to be meaningful. They should go beyond just signing memorandum of understanding. You do need to reach out to the basic science departments within your universities as well, because that's where the key research happens. And that goes back to the first slide when I showed you the recommendations from Dr. Bush and the letter from, from President Roosevelt. That is the basic science, which is, the, which is the foundation and everything follows from there. The role of research mentors is really important here. And I mean mentors of international standing. You can create mentorship programs in your universities or you can send aspiring local research mentors for sabbaticals to international institutes. But you can send, you have to send them with certain goals, outcome driven sabbaticals, which are designed with the help of psychoanalysts so that they can bring something unique back to homeland. And they can create some meaningful research culture when they come back and influence the government policies towards scientific research for a meaningful change. And this is just looking beyond research for promotions. And I think, we shouldn't be looking at this in a negative way, but serial psychological assessment of people who are going through that teething phase is really, really important so that we are not lying to ourselves. At the end of the day, we really want to get rid of the culture of bullying, harassment, undermining, discrimination, which is prevalent in most of the academic institutes all over the world. And I think this is something of interest, at least it was for me, when I figured out that the word mentor is not even an English word. In fact, this is a part of the Greek mythology that when Odysseus went to fight in the Trojan War, he entrusted the care of his son to an older and wiser friend of his, and his name was Mentor. And the word mentor has become synonymous with being a teacher, a counselor, a coach, facilitator, motivator, and friend. And this is what Odysseus was trying to do. He was leaving his son to develop the strong relationship with mentor so that he can guide him and support him. And I think we need very strong and good mentors of international caliber to create that research revolution along with our intrinsic talent that we have so much prevalent in our countries. Here I'll also briefly touch upon the role of artificial intelligence in how it can shape the future in science. We have a lot of data which is not used and all of the data can be used. And all that you need is people who know how artificial intelligence works. Artificial intelligence is a fancy name for data science or data mining. You are basically looking at the hidden patterns of and trying to recognize them and looking for those robust features which you can rely on. And then once you have found those robust features, you can basically validate them internally or externally. And you can automate the whole process because you want to reduce the bias. And this leads on to research such as the multi-omics profiling of certain diseases in which you combine, for example, imaging combined with proteomics, transcriptomics, genomics, and you can combine different things 
to try to find different patterns which you would not have found otherwise. This is quite an important slide which gives you an idea where you can develop a research institute in which all the previous slides can be implemented. And this is, although it's a model institute that I think can exist, but it cannot come about without support of government, enterprise and charitable funding. And we, are, we have got examples of such institutes in the world. We have the Crick Institute in London. We have Max Planck in Germany. We have MRC, LMB, Medical Research Council, Laboratory of Molecular Biology here in Cambridge. And in that research institute, you, need, you can have international board of directors, people who are at the level of Nobel Prize winning at least, or at least that league of people. And these people can internationally peer review those applicants who would be uh, becoming a faculty member of these institute. And these people would come in with disruptive projects and they will become group leaders. And they can be given a five year term with one or two years of leeway, but they will not be tenured post because you want them to produce something in five years. Because if you haven't done anything in five years, the chances are that you wouldn't do it for the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. And this is what Crick Institute at least models itself about. And the same thing at Max Planck as well. Although Max Planck allows people to go from five years going on to another five years after that as well, if you do really well. The funding of groups can then be decided by peer review at institute level with external international reviewers. And the group leaders can have the freedom to hire their staff. And I think it's very important that we have the titles of group leaders, not professors, not associate professors, not assistants, because these hierarchical titles are actually obstacles to scientific research. And we know in our clinical practices, in countries where these titles exist, that how difficult it is for people who are subordinates of someone senior to progress because of the biases, insecurities, and issues associated. So if everyone is at the same level, at least in research, then we would not have those unnecessary obstacles. At least this is a model which is tested. It has been used at these institutes and it is being very successful to produce Nobel Prize winning research at least. Over time, it will promote pure research culture. You can also organize symposium and conferences regionally, which will attract foreign audience ultimately and there will be international interest in your institute. You can also uh, organize boot camps for middle grade and high school students so that the children can look beyond becoming doctors and engineers, and they should fantasize to become scientists. And this thing should be glamorized, just like how Einstein was glamorized back in USA, and the German scientists were glamorized in USA after World War II, World War I. And this is the work of media, and public awareness will also improve with that, and that will bring in funding from the public. I think the academia and medical universities at the moment is academia only in name. And I think once we have these model research institute, only then a meaningful change will come about. And this will be a trickle down effect, and it will take quite a bit of time for this change to occur. However, in university hospitals, I think Physicians, as long as they are consultants, and we do not have those hierarchical titles associated with non-academic positions, I think that's a good starting position to be in. Although most people may not like it who hold these titles. I think with that, I will stop. I've tried to give you an overview of how I think a research vision can basically be implemented based on what the history has taught us. I don't think it was a utopian view. I think it's quite realistic. And at the end of the day, I was just trying to kindle a flame. It's very difficult for me to fill a vessel for you. So with that, I'll stop. And I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sardat. This is Dr. Shemizedi. I'll just uh, open my video. Uh, very, very mesmerizing talk. Obviously, you've been doing it for years. It shows it's like a habit to you. So <laughs> it was a powerful lecture. Uh, what I would, I would initiate discussions uh, based on your lecture you just given. Wonderful thoughts that you've given. The first thing that comes to my mind is the motivation. 
for research, you need a motivation. And the problem that I've noticed is the difference between the developing and the developed countries is that the motivation is different. Like in the developing countries, mostly progress to a higher position. That is the commonest. That is my observation. In the UK and USA, for example, is a different reason. A person wants to do research because there's a thought in his mind, a hypothesis developing, he wants to implement it. He has no ambition to become a richer or a wise man or a position holder or whatever. And there are many, many examples you can think about. So let's start with motivation and the ethical aspects of motivation, because a lot of this has to do with ethics. Can I have your thoughts on that? Then I'll move on to the other subjects. And if somebody wants to ask any question, they're welcome. You know, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask us. So what do you think about motivation that I've just mentioned? So I, I think it's a brilliant question. And I think uh, motivation is, is something which is a key factor in research because it's, it requires resilience. It requires uh, perseverance. It's a painful path. And only people who are really motivated <laughs> will take this path. And I think here you need to have that research culture where you have those mentors who have achieved excellence and they will inspire you. There would be this glamorization of researchers or scientists in that society where these people would be considered as icons. And mm. that will basically create that inspirational environment around you, which will motivate you yourself. And they will basically be your guides or they will hold your hand and walk you along that pathway which I think is very, very important, whether it's a developing country or it's a developed country. And I think the ethical issues, as you said, uh, if, if I understood your co uh, question yes. correctly, the ethical questions are regarding the, the kind of research that they do or- Well, I talk about, see, the motivation, ethical aspect of motivation. Like I yes. said, you know, if it's a general reason you want to research because there's a hypothesis a thing, a question is coming in your mind and non-ethical would be that you want to do it because you want to impress somebody or raise or get a promotion. I, th I think the, the, the way things have been, um, the, the way things are at the moment, at least in NHS or in UK, is that uh, most people are forced to do research when they mm. are training. And you will see that they will fizzle off, you know, by the end of their training. Once they got their CCT, which is a completion of certificate of training, mm -hmm. uh, they will not be producing any more papers. They would not actually take up a PhD. They will take up an MD because that is an unspoken mm -hmm. requirement, which is a part and parcel of the training program. And this has been going on for decades. And I'm totally against such a paradigm which is existing. But for, for people who will actually make a real difference are the purists. And they will only be there, you know, they will not lose uh, their momentum. They will not stop after CCT, they will carry on. And they will only, they will be perhaps less than 1% of the total population of right. who would like to be academics. And you, you only need less than 1% really. Mm -hmm. um, so that ethical or unethical, loosely, loosely using that term, that, that does exist. And I don't think there's any way to, um, to reduce the, that, you know, the, the unethical uh, aspect of it. Right. The other thing that you mentioned, which is very powerful, and your slide on mentorship, reminds me of a talk or a, or a, sub, or a chapter written by Suchita from India uh, for a book that we're publishing on global med. Exactly this, that mentor was a person outside, was the name of a person, like you said, what is this during the Trojan War and things. Now the question is, and this very specific question, how do you identify a genuine mentor? Because there are mentors and mentors. So this is something which I will, I can say from my personal experience, I have reached out to many people who I would love to have as my mentors, but I never mm -hmm. got their attention. Mm -hmm. My feeling is that it normally happens the other way around. It's a mentor who chooses you. You will reach to your mentor, but the mentor will have that, that eye for the talent and he will identify that you have that spark in you. And mm -hmm. this is how it works, at least the way I, I see it. Of course, there would be possibilities or opportunities in which you will reach out to someone and someone may say, okay, I'm very happy to mentor you. But the lasting relationships 
at least in my personal life have been in which someone else actually asked me for something. And that was much more powerful because that person had belief in me perhaps, or he looked mm -hmm. at the potential in me, which I did not know about. And I think you have to, of course, make yourself known or you have to go to someone and present what you want to do. And then the rest will follow. That's what at least I feel. So that's an important thing. Unless, uh, are there any questions anybody would like to ask? Let's see in the chat, bro. How can we overcome the archaic academic culture? That's a good question. How can we overcome archaic academic culture? I'm a member of the IRB at Institute, says the this happened last IBR meeting in which professors did not allow the associate professor to proceed for research. Until unless she considered a professor as the first author, oh, it's a very, very, very common. This is a wonderful, very wonderful interesting question from Dr. Star. Can you please answer this? So th this is something which is very prevalent. And I think here, even I have seen vice chancellors being held hostage to how the different monopolies work within an institute. And I think this has to come from even the higher authorities like the Higher Education Commission or different science foundations, which control the funding of different research institutes or of a university. And there should be reporting methodologies which are entirely independent in which evidence is provided to these uh, funding controlling authorities that such people should just be banned or they should at least be disciplined that they have to fall in line with what the international norms are. I think there is no other easy way about going about how to sort out this archaic uh, culture in my opinion, at least. Yes, the other, the other thing is that you can have, like in the UK, it's a common thing to have uh, whistleblowers. You can't do that in Pakistan and India, you'll be destroyed. But whistleblowers could be very useful if they're encouraged. So I have one more question that's in the chat box that, uh, that discuss the barriers that you discuss. How do you overcome these situations in countries like Pakistan? And I'm sure it happens in India as well, because uh, the bosses sitting at the top, they want to uh, their name to be published in everything. And this happened to all of us, those who are familiar with Pakistan. Is there a way out? Can you bypass this thing? In other words, can you oppose international authorities for collaboration and bypass this? Well, people have reached out to me, at least from a few uh, colleges in Pakistan, yeah. independent of their uh, professors. And they have all been allowed to publish because it, in your own capacity, you can reach out to any international collaborator or an investigator and you can publish. Uh, there shouldn't be anything stopping you. And if your professor or someone who's your line manager uh, comes down hard on you, I think he has got no legs to stand on because this was your initially your own initiative. Of course, you have to be very careful that you're not using the data from that, uh, from that institute or from that hospital or from that department, because of course the ownership of the data belongs to a certain person. So if you are using the patient data or any other data which belongs to that department, then you are, you have to create a program in which the data is not being used from that, um, from that institute or department at least. And then the collaborators uh, can basically work with you and you can have a publication independent of your professors who are stopping you from publishing. And I think meta-analyses, systematic yes. reviews, um, a case, I wouldn't say case reports, but things on those lines, I think they can be done um, quite easily these days. Right, now, can you recommend any international agency who could help the youngsters or even seniors in countries like Pakistan, India, Malaysia, uh, and Africa, so many of uh, our speaker or attendees could be from Africa, where they could join hands with international collaboration. I mean, I was thinking of one, for example, that WHO could be a good source and they provide certain funding international research. Also, as you mentioned in your talk by the institutes like Crick and Watson Institute, will they be able to associate if somebody is doing a research, for example, on oncology or genetics or whatever? I think, I think it's, a, it's a brilliant suggestion. And I think there are certain charities uh, who are willing 
to be the liaison or the middleman between those uh, aspiring academics or researchers in developing countries and these institutes. As long as that uh, middle uh, charitable organization or uh, that society is credible enough, these institutes would be willing to, uh, to use them as liaisons. And I'm not very much sure about a certain entity that exists. I, knew, I do know that Commonwealth scholarships exist. I do know that different uh, charities in Cambridge support aspiring uh, students from developing countries to come and do PhDs or, uh, or, or, or research work, at least in Cambridge, I'm aware of them, but I'm not aware of a research society where someone can tap into it. And they can put them in link, you know, with the institute. So I think that is something which can be worked upon. Uh, and if someone has got uh, financial uh, support as well, such a society, I think that can be quite a powerful tool because, as you know, the institutes like CRIC, MRC, LMB, they also have got limited funding. So you need to have such societies which have got at least a pot of money, which they can help the student to get across from a developing country into UK or US. Um, so I think that's all I can say. But I, I, thought, I thought wealth, Welcome Institute is quite powerful and that helps in many countries. Welcome Institute in, in the Nafield, in the in Lincoln's in area near Houston. Okay. okay. Uh, are you familiar with that? I'm not familiar. Right, so I have a okay. question. Professor, Professor Zedi, Professor can I ask the question, sir? Yeah, yes, yes, of course. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Zadat. Uh, Umar Zadat, I am proud of this. Unfortunately, I am uh, in Sakhar and on the way to, the to Lahore. Uh, there were many, many interesting questions in the chat box and uh, same was my question. Can you simply, very simply, say that in our culture and sub subcontinent, how can we overcome uh, these barriers that you described in your lecture? <laughs> I, I think, I, think I, I was trying to talk about different barriers and I was trying to give solutions as I was going along. So idea generation, mentorship, uh, how to overcome, uh, you know, archaic academic culture. I think, uh, I've, I've kind of touched upon all of them. If there is a certain aspect that you would like to talk, uh, you would like me to talk about, I'm very happy to, ex to expand on that actually. Right, now there is a very interesting- Professor Zadi, can I ask a question please? Uh, Professor yes. Masudur Tayyad from Pakistan. No, yes, I'm uh, in Medina Sharif, now Faro Umrah. Ma ma mashallah. Can yes. I ask a, que a question? Yes. Uh, how can we develop a quality research in Pakistan, the conditions which are present in Pakistan, which as you described, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Professor Anwar Sadat has described in uh, third world countries, and especially in Pakistan, how can we develop a quality research? Yeah, so to do quality research, you need to have funding and you need to have good ideas. These are the two really important things. So if you do not have an idea, you cannot do quality research. So the generation of researchers or thinkers have to be trained to do quality research because no one can give me an idea. I have to come up with an idea. And once you have an idea, you need to have funding to implement that idea or carry out research. So that is why I think uh, faculty members who are in positions, they need to be on sabbaticals abroad so that they can develop that idea generation ability because those ideas have to be really high level because we see that there's a lot of publications as you saw in 2018, which came from Pakistan, but none of them made any impact. They were mostly systematic reviews. They were mostly yes. meta-analysis. So I think this is yes. really yes. important. Now, there are a couple of very good questions and could I ask Dr. Iqbal Heather to unmute uh, himself and ask this very pertinent question. Dr. Iqbal Heather. Uh, Assalamu alaikum yeah, and good yeah. evening everyone from Peshawar, Pakistan. Yeah, also. Uh, 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sadat. It was really a very nice presentation. Uh, I'm working here as a associate professor, Department of Medicine in one of the uh, teaching hospital, having undergraduate uh, medical students of approximately 290 in one session. Um, uh, whenever we, uh, we conduct research for high impact journals, Mm, the basic issue is usually this uh, uh, APC, I mean, article processing charges. Uh, although as per WHO and these criteria, they have way, a way of policy, but when they saw the tag of associate professor or faculty, uh, then they are very reluctant and they have a simple reason that you are in a good position to... <laughs> uh, pay this uh, fee. So living in low middle income country like Pakistan, although it's not a, it's only a low income country, the middle is not appropriate, unfortunately, at the moment for Pakistan. So uh, what as a researcher should we do to convince, uh, although I am a, I'm having a correspondence with the very good journals, uh, but uh, this issue is coming up again and again. And then at the end, I have no option but to um, publish my uh, research work in Pakistan, high, high yield impact journals, which are, are unfortunately only three in number. So your worthy comments will be of great help. Yeah, so I have always tried to avoid publishing in journals um, which asked for article uh, processing fee. Uh, now that has become a bit more common uh, because of the open access policy of these journals. Um, and I think the best thing that you can do is, of course, you cannot change the editorial board policies of these journals. You can just write to them and request that this is where we are. Um, what happens, I mean, we also suffer from similar uh, problems with limited funding, even in Cambridge. You know, uh, students may not have enough funding uh, and we may not have enough funding to publish in a journal. For example, the article processing charges may well be $3,000, you know, or <laughs> maybe uh, $2,000 for one article. So we, we write to these charitable organizations uh, such as the Gates Foundation. I mean, the students are actually sponsored by them or they are on studentships from these charitable uh, uh, bodies. And they have been quite helpful because they know that a student has invested three years of their research time and they have to publish uh, their research, which they were sponsoring for three years. So they normally put their hand in the pocket and uh, they are happy to give a few thousand dollars, you know, which is not much for them. But I totally understand. I think what needs to be done in countries like Pakistan is raising awareness, to raise uh, charitable funding actually, because we do not have charitable funding or philanthropic funding for research whatsoever that I am aware of. I think we do um, our charitable uh, deeds in different ways in our countries, but not towards research. If you see the West, if you look at UK, for example, there are furniture shops where people can go and leave their you know, furniture, which can be basically sold you know, at a profit uh, which can be used basically to pay, for example, British Heart Foundation to generate uh, income for an organization. And that leads to studentships, uh, research fellowships, and things like that. So I think we need to develop this. Um, we, we need to improve the, 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 the spectrum of how the philanthropy works in our countries because we need more money. And that money, of course, is not going to come from government because of the way the GDP is funneled to another very important part of our uh, country. It, it's, not, it's not left for academia whatsoever. So I think it's quite important that we reach out to these philanthropic uh, people who are quite rich and who need to be incentivized. And in, in, in fact, you know, they need to be inspired that this is where they can invest their money. It's not investment that they're going to give them any return at least, but this is something which can be a good charitable deed. So I think that's what I can suggest. Thank you, Dr. Saza. Thank you very much, Professor Shabi. It was my great honor, great pleasure to speak with the audience. And uh, I'm always available. You can let me know whenever you need me and I'll be uh, very happy 
It will be my great pleasure to come back on this platform again. Thank you very much for the great pleasure. Thank you so much.